lunch break and are excited about the second half of our program. Our third speaker of DDAU's Reclaiming Religious Freedom Conference is a member of the Board of Trustees of Americans United for Separation of Church and State, who also helps with the New York City chapter of Americans United. Will you please welcome AU's Jason Stewart. Jason's talk is titled, For They Know Not What They Say, The Real Opponents of Religious Freedom. In his description, Jason said, the religious right say they believe in religious freedom in America, yet their words and actions often speak otherwise. We'll take a humorous look at the contradictions, why it sells, and how to fight back. May I now present Jason Stewart. Yeah, I did write that down, that's how I was going to say it. I wrote all the stuff down of uh, the things I wanted to cover, and I know me, so I'm probably going to ignore everything that's on this paper. But, uh, so, thank you for coming. Uh, welcome. Thank you, Janice, for asking me to speak here today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself. Um, I'm just a regular person, um, not a lawyer, not particularly, I haven't been particularly involved in politics until probably about the year 2000, when that election kind of made a lot of us kind of radical for, <laughs> you know, for certain things. Um, I, I, you know, I, I've been with AU a little over uh, 10 years, and uh, the reason why I joined it, outside of seeing like, you know, Barry Lynn on TV going, oh my god, he makes so much sense, um, is that there, there's so many social issues going on in, in America, and I was trying to figure out, well, Okay, I hear this argument, this doesn't make sense. I hear this argument, but this other issue doesn't make sense. There's something that kind of glues all of it together. And, I, I, you know, when I think about it, I was like, well, a lot of these things are religious-based issues. Like, sort of the things that, these, these contentions that we have. Um, issues between, issues, for, for instance, um, end of life. End of life care. Like, someone wants to have the right to die, why is anyone against it? Well, there are actual religious reasons why some people may be against that happening. Just like reproductive choice, um, gay marriage, as we've talked about a, a lot today. Um, we have public displays of religion and things all over the place. Um, teaching science in the schools. There's so much that religion is like the underpinning of so many things that we argue about in this country. So, I, you know, I joined AU thinking that, that was, it was the perfect place to kind of fight against some of the stuff I was saying. Now, I come you know, from Ohio, I'm an Ohioan originally, and I uh, come from a particularly religious family. Um, you know, more of a sort of a matriarchal type of family where, you know, my grandmother who, um, you see, the thing is I'm used to walking around and moving, as you guys can tell, I'm kind of animated. Um, but in my, you know, my grandmother's house, you would see a wall that was covered in things that just said Jesus like every other plaque, right? So that was kind of the world I, I grew up in. And I, you know, come from a fairly religious, and I, I was never really Baptist, it was not denominational, I guess. I was too young to understand half of the stuff. But I do know that I was speaking in tongues by the time I was six. So, you know, right, at least that they told me I was. But, I, you know, I remember having so many, like, questions about you know, the existence of God and how can God always be. Um, but learning that it was all, overall peaceful, it was a good community, we're all good. Except for those times when I'm, you know, sitting in the church and the pastor's telling me, or, you know, telling all of us that we need to go out in our armies and defend our, you know, the, the, the Christian America against those godless Soviets back then. Godless Soviets and the gay agenda, you know, and go out and kill them. And I'm like, wow, this is kind of a scary, peaceful religion. Um, so, you know, so those are things that as I grew up, uh, grew up hearing these things, I didn't think much about it, right? And, you know, you become an adolescent and you uh, kind of move away from it until you get a girlfriend who also goes to church a lot and they start going to church again. Um, so by the time I got to college, you know, I, I, I moved out into that godless world known as Boston and, you know, went to school there and, and you know, met people of different religions, different non-religions, you know, non-religions, different um, societies, cultures, countries, different countries. You know, growing up in Ohio, you don't really see that many people from another country. And one of my best friends um, that I got, had gotten really close to was moping around the house for weeks, 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 weeks. And 
you know, he, he was pining for somebody, and he finally comes out to me and says, you know, I'm in love with this guy, Mike. And my first answer, of course, is Michelle who? Oh. And, because I, you know, and it's one of those type of things that I had to open up my mind, my uh, idea of, like, what the world around me means, and look back at all the stuff that I was taught, all the things I heard growing up, um, all the sort of standard phrases that we've all heard, like, 800 times. Um, jumping to an idea, like, for example, now, forgive me for the imagery if this creates anything, but I often have my best thinking in the shower when I'm getting ready in the morning. And somehow, I'm in the shower this morning thinking about Leviticus. <laughs> now, <laughs> the phrase that came to my head was, uh, you know, you shall not lie with a man as you lie with a woman. And I was thinking about that, and I really hope I'm the only one who thought of this, because, you know, otherwise it's not as witty as I thought. I, I was like, you know what, that phrase actually only applies to straight men. Because if you're a straight woman, well, you're not going to lie with a woman, so that's, that's cool. Okay, score on that one. If you're a gay man, well, you're not lying with a woman. Okay, score on that. And if you're a lesbian, well, you're not lying with a man. Awesome! So it only applies, so that Leviticus line only applies to, like, straight men. And I'm thinking maybe, I've never heard that before, but I bet you probably, like, Tom Hartman came up with that already, and I'm just catching up. But the thing is, we hear these phrases, uh, you know, we're, there's so many arguments going on in this country. And why does it work? Short, simple lines, short, simple things. Um, what do they call Talking points. The stuff that, you know, people can remember. Um, I was having fun thinking about some of the stuff I was going to talk about today. Um, just kind of going, going back and looking at the sort of, like, just going through Google, trying to find quotes, and just some, some normal outrageous stuff. But the thing is, there's so many of there's so many things that it's that, that we've all heard, and I really and, and and I want you all to thank me because I did not take anything from Ann Coulter, but and I was really thinking about doing it, but I said that. So uh, <laughs> you know, one of the first things when you work for Americans United for Separation Church and State, or volunteer as I do, um, one phrase that we hear all the time is America is a Christian nation founded on Christian. Christian uh, principles. We hear that so much, right? And when, I, when I'm thinking about what that means, um, you know, I, I read the Bible, actually, and I'll get to why I, why I did that later, but um, I was thinking, well, Judeo-Christian principles, when I remember the Bible, there's not a lot of talk about democracy in it, actually. Um, it's actually... There's, there, there's a lot of talk about, you know, especially in the New Testament and all that, you know, doing well for others, doing, you know, doing good. And does that work for equality? I'm not really sure. Sometimes it does. But there are lots of things in the Bible, like, you know, obey your masters, slavery's in there. Okay. So, Judeo-Christian principles of slavery, maybe? I'm not really sure. Um, women? Not really that well in the Bible, actually. Um, and, of course, we have followed that for a long time, even like how long did it take women to get the right to vote and not be considered property of their husband for a while. So I figured that, you know, the next time someone tells me that, you know, America was founded on Judeo-Christian principles, I said, well, the day we go back to slavery and making women property, then we'll discuss that sort of stuff. Otherwise, shut up, because I don't want to hear it. Um, you know, it's that argument that says, well, this is what we were founded on. And you have to ask yourself and ask the person who says that to you, so what? We had slavery at one point. We don't anymore. We evolved. Ah, oh, scary word. I know. We evolved. We have, have, you know, we have a newer way of thinking because we are a society that is strong because we have so many different cultures here. That great melting pot that everyone talks about they really love about America, but forget the second something that they're not used to kind of scares them. So, you know, it makes us a strong nation, and it makes us change. So. The, the, the principles of which this country was founded on, you know, democracy, equality, that sort of stuff, even back then was questionable, right? So, <laughs> let, let's just end that worry about Judeo-Christian principles, and, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about, uh, you know, what that means and how I myself personally have talked to people who, you know, I've gotten in many debates, arguments, fistfights, I don't know, you know, just random stuff like that. But, um... What, what, what brought me 
to, to hear. Like there, there's a point in college, um, kind of circling back, where again, my, my best friend and I, um, we would watch the 700 Club. So I mentioned this earlier. We used to always watch the 700 Club because it was it was absolute pure comedy gold. It was <laughs> if you've ever listened to Pat Robertson speak and say things that just you know they make sense in sort of a twisted, I just finished my peyote and I need more type of way. But it's, you know, it's, it's like, there, okay, for instance, let, let, let me give you an example. Um, what's very typical in a, in a lot of, and I'm going to do this from sort of a Christian perspective, what's, what's kind of typical um, in what I see in sort of religious right, particularly in America, um, and when we say religious right, we're mostly talking Christian, but you know, there, there's others in there, but it's mostly Christian, is this sort of persecution complex. This kind of, you know, if if we let this group have the same things that we have, if we let these people who are different than us have the equality that we that we enjoy, the world will come down, the meteors will crash, and things will destroy us. And, you know, I, I remember at one point that uh, we were talking about, Pat Robertson was talking about smart cards. I'm a nerd, so I remember this kind of stuff. Those little things that you might have on your credit card, on your phone, that sort of thing. And that was considered the mark of the beast when money, how did he put this? Money would no longer uh, be represented by actual, like, you know, cash, but instead by numbers and digits. And that was a sign of the mark of the beast. And I remember at the time, I'm like, well, we have credit cards already. I don't understand what he's talking about. But I honestly think neither did he, but it was Pat Robertson's show, so he, you know, he has a, he's allowed to do this on the ABC or something for whatever uh, contract he had set up with them. But there, there's that that he would do these skits and these sort of like vignettes of persecuted Christians around the world, or especially in America. My favorite one, and I'm going to waste time a ton, a ton of time talking about this, but it's hysterical. My favorite skit he ever did was it's about this wonderful, wholesome family that was just watching on TV, this nice, wholesome, nuclear family around the television. And they're looking at what it looks like a weather report, you know? And there's a weatherman like, talking about a, you know, um, a cloud of something coming. And as you, as you go in the story in this, in this skit, you see that they're not talking about weather, they're talking about riots. The riots are coming. And this family, this wonderful nuclear, white, gorgeous family, is sitting there frightened because little Tim is caught out in the storm of riots. And you're thinking, well, a storm of riots? But the riots weren't of like, you know, something like in Baltimore or something like that. They were the riots of the atheists and the godless people coming to claim, you know, control over the Christian world. And so you see. They said, but little Timmy's outside, and you cut to, and you see Timmy on a little bicycle riding for dear life in front of this horde of people that are the godless atheists, and if you look very closely, that horde of people are mostly minorities. I kid you not. Now, <laughs> you know, these are the sort of things you watch this, you're like, this is before we had, well, we had VCRs, but we didn't at the time, but this is the sort of thing that, like, if you could ever, if anyone could ever find this clip, it was hysterical, because it was so racist at the same time it was, you know, the, the atheists are coming to kill you all. You know, they, there, was, there was another um, example where they had a, a, a different type of clip where they show these SWAT team descending on this, this the dark warehouse area. And you know, it was very tactical, very professionally made video. And as you know, you hear the walkie talks and everyone, they, when they say, when they go in there, they start just shooting everyone they can see. They're just, just blowing everyone away. This is on the 700 Club, okay? This is on the 700 Club. They're shooting everyone. And then when they finally like pan to and show you who they were going after, the terrorists or the bad guys, it was a room full of children with their Bibles praying. Pat Robertson on his TV show had a bunch of children murdered on TV. This is the type of stuff that a lot of people, you know, where I come from, where, you know, where I was born and raised, see that and go, 
Mm -hmm. That's just exactly how it's going to be in about 10 years. This is the type of thing that we have to fight against. As Brian said earlier, you know, you have to talk to people in sort of the, you know, in sort of the language they understand. Um, it's not, it's, it's not going to be easy for everyone. Some people have a Christian background, Jewish background, no religious background whatsoever. Some people are particularly good at, like, quoting scripture or counter scripture. Um, if any of you are familiar with, like, a, a, a radio host and a comedian named John Fugelsang, he's really good with that. You know, he can just throw it right back at you. And that is not easy for everybody. So sometimes you have to go back on the, how sick are you? <laughs> you know, like, like we said, like, look at it from the, from the equality standpoint. But at the same time, put it back in the faces, man. I mean, there, I, I, I've heard many people, uh, you know, and I will say this disclaimer, again, American United for Separation Church and State is nonpartisan. But I'm going to make fun of George Bush. So, um, I re you know, I remember at the time um, when, he, when he was running for president and people were saying, you know, what good Christian he is. And, you know, yes, he had alcoholic problems, uh, problems with alcohol and all that good stuff. But, you know, he, he's turned a cheek that was in his youth when he was like 40 and something years old. And, you know, it, it, you know and, and I used to argue with people telling them that that is not the benchmark you should be voting for for a leader of your country. Um, particularly because, and I refer to Bush to a number of religious people this way, as a false prophet. Now, that really hit a couple people hard, and that was the point. You know, because everyone, you know, especially from that Christian side of things, they know what that means. It's, um, you know, we talk in politics all the time about code words and buzzwords. You know, we have that thing a lot when we talk about race relations, there's coded words and, and dog whistles, that sort of thing. Um, you can do the same thing. It's kind of fun sometimes, I gotta admit. Um, it can be a little dangerous, but at the same time, um, you know, when I when, when I throw things back at someone saying, like, you know, we have to kill these Muslims because they don't understand, you see pictures of them with, uh, you know, with their Koran in their hand and, you know, a salt weapon in the other. And I can go on YouTube right now and show you a picture of a nice blonde girl with her Bible, American flag, and an AK-47. You throw that stuff back in their face, and of course, sometimes it's a little combative, right? Um, I'm not necessarily, you know, I'm kind of like a happy-go-lucky type of person. Um, I do like going for the jugular from time to time, because I think it's kind of necessary. Um, there, there are things that we can do, and there are things that we can say that kind of bring it back home that if you feel persecuted, um, we hear about this all the time, Christians are being persecuted in America even though, you know, they sort of make up the majority when people talk about what their faith is, the majority of them are going to say they're Christian, even though about 37% of them consider themselves practicing Christian. Um, seriously, 37%, and that was from a religious study. Um, you know, they talk about the persecution, and then we hear this uh, story in Kenya, uh, you know, against actual Christians at a school in Kenya being murdered. You know, that's real persecution. And so when someone comes to me and says, oh, Christians, you know, we're being persecuted, I say, that's persecution. Tell me the day that someone comes in your house with a machine gun and starts killing you because you're a Christian in America, then we can talk. Until then, shut up. See, I said that again. Uh, you know, so, you know, there, there are a lot of things that, 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 that we cover, that we talk about, that I argue with um, from the stuff I hear. And... During, during my time being with AU and advocating um, church-state separation, I like to argue. I didn't argue. I'm not a lawyer. I don't really think I have an aptitude for remembering any date past yesterday. But um, one, one, of, one of my favorite times of the year is CPAC, because we get lots of religious crazy out of that. We really do. Um, and we get some from some people who are essentially really, really smart. I picked a couple of Ben, uh, ben Carson ones I really, really loved. Um, you know, there is, Ben Carson's a neurosurgeon, so he's a scientist and, you know, a devout Christian, as he says, and someone asked him, you know, how can you merge science and religion? How, you know, how can you have your faith? And his answer wasn't really something along the lines of, like, say, like, even 
even the, I think the Pope at one point said, like, after the Big Bang, we don't really know what happened before that. Well, scientists say this, you know, after the Big Bang thing, we don't really know what's before that, so we don't care. His, his sort of response was, well, my faith is, is useful because it helps me figure out if the science is propaganda. <laughs> Seriously, and, and I was like, well, that's what peer-reviewed studies are for. Seriously, but never mind that, you know. Um, what, what did I write down here? It says, it was our Judeo-Christian values, there it is again, that allowed this to be an exceptional country. It allowed us to move forward so incredibly quickly, and as we abandoned God, you can see we're spiraling downward just as quickly. As we abandon God, we are spiraling down just as quickly. So, there's that theme of America's abandoning God. You'll hear that too a lot. Um, I'll say often, the day we abandon God is the day we can actually get an atheist elected president in this country. Let me hear it. <laughs> you know, it's the day that can happen, talk to me. Otherwise, shut up. So, you know, um, there are a lot of things that people say like this. It's like, you know, this country is getting worse off because we've taken prayer out of schools. Um, well, there are a lot of reasons why we may have problems in our schools. Most of it does, deals with funding, um, you know, and actual adherence to education. But I won't go on that speech for you because I'll be here for another three hours. Um, there, there, are, there are so many different avenues of how, how people look at it that, when I, when I hear sort of the religious underpinning of it, every problem that we have is because we've taken God out of the equation. Now, there's a saying I like to say, I, I came up with this a couple years ago, um, when I was speaking to people talking about the importance of church-state separation. Um, I say, when we, when my, my, my little quote here is, uh, when we fight to uphold the separation of church and state and uphold the principles, of the separation of church and state. We protect them from each other, and in the process, we strengthen both of them. That's very, very important, because I, you know, I have family through my, through my wife and in-laws um, in Europe, and Europeans have had a history of, uh, certain, certain countries have had a history of very strong religious, you know, part of the state, that sort of thing. Outside of the Middle East, we're not even going to go there. But, you know, and in, in Europe particularly, you know, they, they've done studies that people have sort of a religious um, affiliation, but their devotion to it became less so over the years because, you know, when the government institutes these certain sort of religious structures on you, people start to pull away, particularly if they have the freedom to do so. One of the reasons I think that America has such a strong religious foundation, a strong religious background, is because for many years, at least up to like, you know, the last 30 or so, um, we actually paid attention to that. We actually respected that separation, that boundary between, you know, let the politicians do what they need to do, let the government do what it needs to do, let the religious people do what they need to do. And we've set up laws to, to protect religious, you know, influence from the government and protect people's ability to follow the religion as they see fit. Until, of course, practicing religious people somehow became buildings and corporations, which I'll never understand because, you know, just like the Hobby Lobby case, you know, the Supreme Court has said, hey, that closely held corporation has a religious, it is religious. And, and people applauded that. I mean, some people applauded. A lot of religious people applauded that. A lot of religious people actually didn't. And to me, it was a really interesting uh, conversation I had uh, with a certain Christian friend of mine who was saying that was a very good thing because it protected uh, a person's business from you know, making them not have to buy or sell the same thing they're going to sell anyone else. But, or in the Hobby Lobby case, it was uh, you know, uh, uh, contraception, that sort of thing. And I said, well, I haven't seen any Hobby Lobby buildings in a church. I don't know how that physically works. How does Hobby Lobby go to heaven? How does Hobby Lobby go to hell? You know, it's one of those sort of things that it, it just sounds ludicrous on its face, but our Supreme Court, you know, since people are corporations sometimes or something like that. But I said, well, think of it this way. If you're a religious person, 
you know, you've read your Bible, you believe in God, you believe that man is the chosen, no animals, no souls, none of that kind of stuff. You're the man is the chosen one, and the, and the good, good, you know, people go to heaven. That didn't include a building. That didn't include a corporation that only exists on paper. And that's not the argument that people really cared about. That didn't really sway, like, you know, the, the person I was talking to. The part that swayed him was when I said, don't you find that sacrilegious? Don't you find that an abomination of your faith? Is to say that a business has the exact, a, a corporation, a building, has the exact same view under God as you. And you applaud that. You know, <laughs> these are the kind of conversations that you can have, and sort of like what, what Brian said earlier, it's taking their language back to them. I just happen to be a little cooler about it because I throw it back in their face, but you know. That